at 8.38 in studio with the boss, the mogul, the owner, Mike Hornby. Good morning. Love the jacket, Ben. Thank you, sir. New York Times best-selling author because they don't track the worst-selling ones. There you go. Those dudes just wash out quickly. <laughs> they do. They retire do anonymously. Anonymity. <laughs> anonymity. Yeah, it's the worst <laughs> thing that can happen to you if you're an author. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. John Gilstrap. Good morning. Loving the Christmas fest. Thank you. Yeah, that, that was at the Gilstrap party, was it not? It was, and I, and I would tell you, I wasn't. I was just going to come normally, but I saw Espinosa's sweater yesterday. I thought <laughs> if if he has the courage to wear that where people can see it, then I will wear my Christmas vest. I had no idea that I was going to be upstaged. Well, you know, Espinosa started something because I think uh, our next guest also brought a little Christmas spirit in the room. That is uh, the Delegate John Hardy. Good morning, Mr. Hardy. Good morning. I saw Paul on yesterday and said, uh, well, I'm going to have to step my game up for this morning. Christmas tie. Yeah. You uh-huh. clean up good. Thank you. Thank Christmas you. tie. Also, the mayor, Kevin uh, Noel, still hanging out with us, too, during this uh, segment. Good morning. We've got a couple of delegates and a mayor. I we're in trouble now, right? And I've got an author to <laughs> write it all down as it goes. <laughs> I'm taking notes. <laughs> uh, John, you folks are headed back to Charleston in just a couple of weeks. January 6th begins one more session. This will be the last year of Governor Justice's eight-year term. That seems like it went kind of fast, doesn't it? It did. It did. It seemed, you know, it was uh, some interesting times and some interesting work. Governor Justice is a very interesting gentleman to uh, be around and to work with. I've gotten to know him uh, over the past couple years, and uh, he's one of those kind of guys, you know, uh, you become friends with him pretty quickly. He's a very uh, likable person. Uh, I wouldn't want to work for him or wouldn't want to do business with him, but, uh, (laughs) you know, to hang out with him, um, he's uh, really uh, just a a kind of a man's man. He's, he's He's a fun guy to hang out with. And he's very personable. I mean, it does not take long for him to, you know, just feel like he's one of your old fishing buddies. Yeah. But, uh, um, you know, he can be quite cantankerous when he does not get his way. He wants things his way. And uh, we've seen some battles between him and the Senate. Uh, him and Senate President Craig Blair have had some, um, you know, some battles. And also the chairman of finance in the Senate, uh, Senator Eric Tarr, they've had some pretty uh, – uh, public star is not a fan. <laughs> no, no, they've had some pretty public, uh, you know, uh, fights, and that's that's bled over into some of the secretary positions. And but uh, you know, the governor is the governor, and uh, you know, he he has his ideas on how things want to work. And so, uh, so how did you develop that relationship on a one-on-one level as a delegate? You never met the man before you went down there. Um, was it because you were on finance, or is, is it just the longer you're down there, the more you get to know these people? Well, you know, I really had never uh, tried to have a relationship with the governor. I never really reached out to him. Uh, I just kind of went down and did my thing. And then as I became the vice chair of finance, uh, more involved with the budget process and making the, you know, building the budget, uh, working very closely with the governors. You know, and we put three budgets together. The governor has a budget, the Senate has a budget, and the House has a budget. And then we have to work to try to meld all three of those together and everybody be in a happy place when we're finished. So, uh, you know, I, I uh, work with the governor's office quite closely, Berkeley, Bentley, um, and a few other people from the governor's office uh, with our budget and their budget and also working with uh, Senator Tarr and a few other people from the Senate. Uh, So you just start to build those relationships. And then um, I actually did the tax cut, the House. It was the governor and the House's tax cut. I did that bill on the floor. I I, um, presented that bill. And uh, so I worked pretty closely with the governor on that and uh, got to spend the day with him um, on his private jet flying to a few places uh, uh, (coughs) promoting that bill. So that was kind of interesting. you know, a paint contractor and a building contractor from <laughs> Martinsburg, West Virginia, flying around on a billionaire's private jet. You know, is like, it a nice jet? Uh, it's a it's a Cessna Citation. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's nicer a, than yours. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's ever seen it's one. A, yeah, yeah. It's a private one. jet. You know, so so yeah. I mean, it was a little surreal. Uh, but uh, you know, like I said, the governor is a very personable person. He's a very easy person to like. Uh, when you meet him one on one, but he is he can be quite cantankerous, and there's you know, obviously there's a, a a group of people that don't care for the governor or the way that he conducts himself. But uh, and you know he he sometimes he he can be very come off kind of hokey. Um, but uh, you know it's it's going to be interesting to see this Senate run and and how that happens, and then what's really going to be interesting uh, on the state of the state this year being his last year, what he's going to introduce. I'm really hoping that we hear something from the governor about locality pay. I mean, there's, there's been some talks that there may be some, you know, West Virginia has a very, the governor is a very in a very powerful position. So the governor can really move the needle um, on um, policy. So if the governor comes out in his state of the state and talks about 
locality pay, then that will really help move the needle. John, um, did you hear Daryl Scholl's interview I did, yesterday? I, I did not. I so, did not. So, so Magistrate Scholl did some re, uh, research on uh, eviction rates in the eastern panhandle and compared us to Kanawha County, a county which is similar in size, larger, but I think by about 50,000 people for now, and looked at the, the eviction rates. And Berkeley County's eviction rates are much higher than Kanawha County's. And then he looked at the average rent in Kanawha County, which is roughly $800, and the average rent in Berkeley County, which is roughly $1,100. And you make a correlation between the eviction rates. And it, it, to me, makes a great point for why locality pay in this area is so important. And for all the other reasons that we have given to the delegates around the state who have not bought into this idea of somebody being worth more in the Eastern Panhandle than elsewhere, this is a piece of data I don't think you folks have ever had access to before, nor have you been able to use it as a point for lobbying for locality pay. I think this would hit home better than anything else you've ever presented to others who don't agree with locality pay. Well, and I, and I feel like we're gaining ground on that. We, we are gaining ground on the votes every year. We seem to pick up a few votes, um, and I've worked delegates myself. Uh, I just gave this, I, I met with the Chamber of Commerce in Jefferson County the other day, and I gave this little, um, little speech about the gentleman that sits right next to me on the House floor is... Um, Pinson. Yeah, Jonathan Penson. So Jonathan Penson is from... Impressive. Yeah, he's from Mason County. So Jonathan Penson was, you know, was probably never a big fan of locality pay, but Jonathan Penson was uh, was able to understand how much the Eastern Panhandle delegation worked to bring in new core steel, and the the votes that we took to be able to, um, you know, come up with that seed money to be able to help with infrastructure, with rail, with river, uh, you know, all the things that new core steel was going to need, and that has been a huge. Um, uh, bump to Mason County. I mean, you're talking about uh, lifetime changes of people that are going to have jobs there making money that was never available before. So Jonathan and some of those other delegates in those areas have understood that we are all in. We are trying to make every part of West Virginia better because the better we can make other parts of West Virginia, the less they will ask from us. And it's the old thing, rising ties, raids all shit. Yeah, the more they will see how much economic development how how much the more we do with that economic development piece the more votes we will get for locality pay i think yeah i would say that we probably picked up six votes through the new core and then uh yeah. the the form energy bill which you know which was pretty That's three more yeah that was probably at least three or four more yeah. votes that we picked up for locality pay and so the form energy bill has become kind of a wedge issue here in eastern Pena, which makes no sense to me i i meant to bring the paperwork in with me to show you the economic development that that uh piece of legislation has produced and what's going on up there we had an interim session up in wheeling a couple months ago uh, we stayed at uh what was that place called? ogilvy ogilvy yeah and uh the people could not have been finer or nicer and we were able to see how that legislation has affected that area and has brought huge economic dividends back to that area and putting people to work not only in just the new core steel but all the surrounding areas and all the ancillary businesses the lumber yards the block you know the block plants the cement plants i mean there, there's a new life up there there has been new life um breathed into that area up there yeah, and that, and that city's undergoing a huge change we, like yeah like wheeling is says, yeah, yeah wheeling is, is going to through a huge um, undertaking of uh, bringing their infrastructure up to, uh, you know, par and and a lot of stuff with their uh, building facades and sidewalks and so I mean there's there's a lot of things going on in Wheeling and it only stems to to understand the better that we can make every part of the state, the less the state will ask from us. But can locality pay for teachers happen if the teachers union is not on board? I think so. I think so. I mean, I, you're not going to get the teachers' unions on board. They're, right. They're never coming on board. And I, I don't think— And their we, issue is not that Eastern Panhandle shouldn't be paid more. It's just that yeah, Eastern right. Panhandle should not be paid more than— Sure. But if you— Mingo County. They, they want to raise everybody's yeah. wages. Right. I mean, and everyone—and and like we, like I've said on this radio show many times before, it's, it's not really a cost of living. I mean, the cost of living is kind of what the cost of living is. It's, it's the real estate and your, the real estate, the property that you either rent— or you own that you live in costs substantially more here than it does other places. Now, you know, maybe going out to eat maybe a little bit costs a little bit more, but you know, a gallon of milk and a pack of bread or a loaf of bread kind of costs what it costs. 
Um, but the the rent, as Rob spoke, that uh, that the uh, magistrate Scholl had talked about, the homes that we live in, the tax rate that we pay on those uh, real estate taxes on those homes, is really where the difference is. What do you see as the amount of the bump for the border counties? Are we talking ten percent, twenty five percent? Well, you know, there was a we when we put that bill together for our um, uh, caseworkers for the uh, CPS. CPS and abuse and neglect and stuff. There was a caveat in that piece of legislation for where there was emergency need, and I think we'll try, probably try to build off of that. I'll tell you one of the things that really worries me. This is something that really concerns me. We have not had much snow around here for the last couple of years. Mm-hmm. If we get a big dumping of snow in Berkeley and Jefferson County, be ready to sit in your house for four or five days. Because I will tell you, Berkeley County has, uh, I think it's either 38 or 42 slots for DOH workers. I think right now they have 17. And they have been as low as 12. Now, everyone knows if we get a big snowstorm, what's the number one priority? Interstate 81. Interstate 81 will be taken care of because commerce has to move. Then they'll move to the primaries, the secondaries, and tertiaries. So if you live back a ways and we get one of those three or four footers like we tend to get once every 10 years plan on being home for four or five days it's supposed to be according to the farmer's almanac a pretty big uh, winter storm in the middle of january around this area yeah what's interesting in our in our neighborhood charleston though in our neighborhood we have this this budget for snow plowing so whatever when it happens and my question is always going to be that goes to the county road though right well well, yeah but it's a private road and i'm thinking how how does a snow plow get to our little road to plow it when you know you've got Scrabble Road out there, it's going to be buried for quite some time. Sure, Kevin, what's the situation in the city with DPW workers? You know, we're we're fortunate. We've uh, I think we filled every slot now for the Department of Public Works, and I was just at the Utilities Department yesterday, and uh, uh, there's one one slot one slot open there. Our, our biggest void is the the police department. Uh, police department's down 13, and and uh, we're doing everything we can to, to recruit, and we have, as I told you earlier, eight eight on eight on the books now that we're, we're we're interviewing to hopefully get through the process. But that takes a year to build that back up to full strength. But uh, finding employees is tough. It's tough, mm-hmm. but um, we we have a, a we, we will be opening up our city streets if we get that. <laughs> yeah, and <laughs> just to touch on what Kevin just said there, let's talk about our state troopers. So uh, you know, unfortunately, we had that tragic yeah. shooting the other night. Uh, two state troopers wounded. Um, let's talk about state troopers. Mm-hmm. We probably Berkeley County should probably have thirty yeah. to forty troopers. We probably I think yeah. we have twelve on the road right now. Yeah. So now I'm not saying that there may be a few more that's working, you know, in the barracks and doing, you know, the administrative stuff. But I think there's 12 state troopers on the road for Berkeley County and versus 67 there, or 68. I don't think there, I don't think there's 12 on the road at the same time. No, 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 no. no, no. I but I think that's that's, that's probably like a six and six, 12, you know, two, 12 shift. But yeah. yeah, but Berkeley County doesn't get the state troopers no. because they get shifted to the south because they don't have the the tax base to have a sheriff's mm-hmm. department. They may have one sheriff and one deputy, so they have to overload. With state troopers. Ah, good point. So, John, let me. I want to get back to the teachers thing. We we hear here in the in the on the show over and over again about the surpluses, eight hundred million dollars every year. So we have the rainy day fund, and we have the surplus. We have all this. Why not just give an across the board raise to teachers throughout the state? But we have. We have. We've well, but we also hear that the the teachers are terribly paid compared to. And I don't know these numbers, right? But the last quote was back to fiftieth or something to that effect. Right. So why not bring whatever the amount would be to become closer to well, Fairfax and Loudoun County in terms of pay? And you, instead of just focusing on the Eastern Panhandle for locality pay, go ahead and do it across the. Didn't board. you try to do that? Mike? So, uh, you, well, I'm on the Education Committee, so yes, we we're we're, we're spending money um, and. and the finance is, is the finance <laughs> department. Even John Hardy kept saying no, no, no. no. And you got to. We passed a bill that said, you know, it, it's going to be based on where you are um, and your surrounding states. That price tag was like a hundred and something million, but that's every single year. Um, with the flatline budget um, that we've we've done, and John can speak to this a little more. Um, it's hard to spend to grow your your base. So, and I know the legislature has passed five percent tax or increases for everybody. That that's all state workers, which I think is probably more equitable. Um, so we have passed through the education committee those types of uh, those bills, but it's tough to get them through. It's tough to get everybody on the same 
boat to say, okay, hey, we're going to give. Well, you'll and, and since I've been in the legislature, we've done, I think, 15% yeah. in pay raises to our public employees. Now, the last year's pay raise was a 5%, but that was really not a pay raise because that was to offset the, PE, the, the rise in PEIA. PEIA is the looming monster that's in the background that the can was kicked down the road. I remember when I first was elected to the legislature, um, Daryl uh, Coles had talked to me about putting, we were putting money in the back door and how that really wasn't, you know, it was it was going to come back to catch us to bite us because we weren't really funding PEI properly because the governor did not want to raise premiums and then finally on the private sector the private sector made a move and just said we're not going to accept it anymore so we had to our hands were forced and the governor's hands were really forced to say well if the product that we're offering is not accepted by anyone then it, what really good is the product so we have to work on the product so there was the rise in the PEI premiums and I think they're going to go up this year again yeah. and uh, you know public employees did enjoy a long period of time without rises in their uh, insurance premiums that we did not see in the private sector but to get back to what you said I mean that that's for us to infuse that m amount of money into our budget our base building budget is not fair to the taxpayer it's not fair to the taxpayer who is being if we're having those surpluses that taxpayers being overtaxed um, at some point. Well, we're, I'm being deliberately obtuse here. Or, but, or underserved. Is what or underserved, say. yeah. So if, if, in fact, if we accept as gospel that our teachers are, are more are more poorly paid, that's a terrible way to put that, than the surrounding states, and therefore it's having a deleterious effect on our education, which is putting us in an embarrassing position nationwide. If that is the issue, then I think there's a logical, logical argument to say that we should, if we pay them more, then the, edu the, the education would improve. I'm not sure I buy off on that premise, but that's, but, but that's what is being stated. So is the issue with teacher pay and locality pay, is it the disparity that they don't want uh, the the teachers and panhandle to make more than than elsewhere or is it we just don't want to pay the teachers more well I would I mean I would say that you know if we're talking about teachers being underpaid in the state of West Virginia there's probably a, maybe about five or six counties where teachers are grossly underpaid and then there then that starts to you know work its way down but if you're living in Wayne County or you're living yeah. in some of those other counties and you're a 20-year veteran teacher making sixty thousand dollars a year you are living pretty well now yeah, the, cost, the cost of living here is way lower than our surrounding states, you, you have to realize. Sure, and our and our and the taxes we collect is way lower. That's yeah. why people and and we're not about to change that. Right. Well, I you, mean, you, you talk about the surrounding states, and, and I know that in, in Pennsylvania that the school districts are more controlled yeah. locally. Yeah. You know, it, has the state considered that moving that the the splitting it up into different it, categories or different I, areas I mean, so we, that. We do. It is locally controlled because the, the local BOEs control their own budget and things like that. They just don't, the, the way they it don't is, control the they don't control the, the, the salaries because that has always been controlled by the unions, right? The, it, it, under how many years of Democratic? Uh, 80. 80 the, the, the unions always had control of that and the power. I think that's shifting, and I think w we can start to look at those options. Well, in, in in Pennsylvania, there's there's different parts of Pennsylvania. There's yeah. different salaries for each yep. uh, of of the, the teachers coming in, and it's based on the local economics, the local uh, the local the local borough sets the millage rate, and you get your teacher pay right. out of that. And Amendment rate. Two would have probably helped with that, but uh, the way our constitution is, we have to have a school board that controls it. And well, and, and, if you, and, centralization and of realistically, the, the state of yeah. West Virginia has one has one of the most centralized governments out yeah. of any other state, and I think that. I've said before that we really need to get some really smart people, five or six or ten some really smart people in a room, take two years and do a complete constitutional rewrite. Our, our constitution Great. is is a... It's outdated. It's completely yeah. outdated. I mean, it, it is a... Um, a depression era constitution it's very centrally located the power all the power is in charleston yeah we can't I, even I, we can't even sell beer in, in yeah West so we, we do need to do a complete yeah. constitutional rewrite and i believe originally you know when the when the state was founded there was a lot of distrust um in in the in the people 
of Western Virginia, and our original Constitution was really written uh, by lawmakers from uh, Maryland and Pennsylvania and a few other states really wrote our original Constitution, and I believe that they put a lot of central power in that original Constitution because they just didn't trust the people of Western Virginia. And I think when the, as the constitutional rewrite happened, I think the biggest the, was 1930, 1928, 29, something like that. A lot of that stuff just just stu- still stuck in the Constitution. So I think it's really you know important for us to, and I don't know if that'll ever happen, but it would be nice to to sit down and at least address. Uh, portions of the Constitution that are just completely outdated. Good so point. constitutionally, could the Board of Education in Berkeley County decide to pay their teachers ten thousand dollars more? We we do year? now. We, we do. We now. have a we, levy for that. We, we have yeah. a le- we have a levy for that, and then we also. But you also get penalized for having the levy, do well, you? Well, yeah, and, you sure know, do. I, I, yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna I'll spit a little knowledge here that it probably makes some some citizens' heads explode, you know, and this is things that I've learned in the legislature. That's why so I had on right yeah, now. Yeah, so if we pass a levy so we can raise more money locally, then they take that share away from our, so the state takes that from us. So if, if we're getting our um, per pupil funding formula. We get $800 less per teacher because we have Because that. we've raised that money locally. So you're being penalized <laughs> for doing the right thing yeah. locally. So, I mean, the, it's it's... It's crazy how the school board, the, the state school board does that and how those formulas work. Well, so it's almost the more local buy-in you have, crazy. That's crazy. they take the money from you. And, and the school aid formula was built so long ago, and then we just added and, and manipulated it. It needs a full rewrite and re Dale, thing, and I've got a, a resolution to, to help with that. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Dale, Dale Lee on the program had said one of the solutions would be to change the law so you can keep more of the local share, John. And he said that was changed several years ago where they upped the local share by about 5% that you could keep. If you, if you increase that by another 5 or 10%, you could then use that pool of money to increase teacher pay locally, and that's how you get around locality pay. I, I, heard, I heard Mr. Lee talk about that, and, and that's something that I would like to explore. I mean, the entire time that I've been in the legislature, I have worked to try to keep more money in the Eastern Panhandle. Mm-hmm. Every, almost every piece of legislation that I have focused on and worked on was to keep tax dollars here, bring tax dollars here, give us more magistrates, bring the stuff here that we need. And it's very frustrating uh, in the legislature to go and work to, to to try to make the other parts of the state understand the challenges that we have, the challenges that we face, and they just believe that, you know, we have more money than we know what to do with, and we're down there crying and looking for more stuff. But our challenges are so different <laughs> than any other part of the state. And, and another thing is our roads. You know, our, our roads, so, you know, everyone has noticed how much traffic has really grown. Well, our county commission, our, we don't have any control over roads. I mean, everything from entrance points to, uh, you know, when or for developments have to have a DOH um, sign off on where they're going to have their entrances and trying to grow our roads, making them, you know, two lane, three lane, four lane. There's no local control in that. And, and there's no local control over the growth either. That's, there's, there's, that's the next The issue. only way the county commission has any way, any way to control growth is through water and sewer. Mm-hmm. It's the only way, it's the only thing that the county has. We don't have zoning. The county has spoken loud and clear that they don't want zoning. So if we don't have zoning, we, we can't control growth. Which is fine. I'm, I'm not saying I'm a proponent of, of zoning, but the only tool in the tool bag that the county has to control growth is to control the water and sewer. And if you look at a map at the growth of Berkeley County, it follows the water and sewer. Yeah, and that's going away. The water. You're losing water. You're county. losing water? Well, the county is running out of infrastructure for the, the water. Well, we're... We're getting ready to. We need. Let's just let you hang on to that. Yeah, you're gonna stay. Yeah. Yeah. Kevin's gonna hang out another half of an hour here, and uh, so is John and uh, the other John. And who's been I'll be quiet. here for the whole hour. And Mr. Hornby too. <laughs> this is the uh, the season of merriment, decorations, and joy. And uh, in the city of Martinsburg, they give out an award uh, for some of the best decorations out there. Colin, do you have the graphic you can bring up for us uh, right now with the the, uh, the Griswold Award? Uh, it is called here. Kevin, you recently presented somebody with the championship trophy. What's up? Yeah, well, uh, three years ago I started, when I first became mayor, a uh, decorating contest for Christmas. And um, we only had one category back then and overall. And and it kind of grew and grew. And each year that uh, uh, we had this the third year, um, more houses were getting more involved. People were getting calling me up. They're sending me messages. So we made two divisions. This is the Griswold champion, and we had a traditional champion. Mm-hmm. 
and I believe there's a picture of that too. The traditional one is out on uh, I think it's 1214 King Street, King. and he does amazing, a, a wonderful traditional. Now these Griswolds are are amazing in itself. They they had uh, they take up two or three lots, and you know this one here would would have snow coming out and fake snow come out. They'd have a they would have a uh, another one would have a, a live Grinch running around had just this, this and and in areas that you would not even believe there's yeah. the one of the winners was on a, a street called daniel street off of wilson street which is one block long yeah and it's all down at the end if you you'd never see it just right. passing by and, the, and then the other one is on 1400 block of west virginia avenue which is the last block in the city and it's and you, you wouldn't know unless 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 there was some advertisement for it so i it was think a great you, i think your residents of the city have really taken this and ran with it. Yeah, uh, it, it's been truly remarkable to see the the decorations within the city of Martinsburg. That's awesome. So if you if you know these folks, uh, let them know that their uh, decorations were featured on the program today, and they can uh, go back on Facebook and see it on the program or on YouTube, where we isolate each individual half yeah, hour. Yeah, there's there's a winner of every ward. So there was five ward winners, and two overall winners. Mm -hmm. So I mean, there's. It was it was great to do. Great That's to awesome. Yeah. I tell you something that I've been involved in uh, lately that I'd never done before was parades. I I never really did parades, and, and with my you know running for county commission, um, me and my wife talked and said it would probably be nice to do a couple parades. So we did uh, the Martinsburg parade. We didn't do the Christmas parade, but we did the uh, Apple Harvest. The Apple Harvest parade, and it is. And we did the one in South Berkeley, which was huge. I could not believe. I mean, all the parades are very well attended. Uh, the one in South Berkeley was a lot of people. The one in the city was a lot of people. And I'm just really surprised at how many people attend them and how well those things are run. And, like, it just really uh, 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 builds a sense of community and camaraderie. I, was, I told my wife, I was like, I was just amazed how these parades just pull everybody together and so the, the level of excitement. Everybody yeah. loves a parade. Yeah, it's, it's funny because I, I was down in um, – uh, Spencer, West Virginia, two weeks ago, and I'm sitting next to the city manager from Princeton, and he's he said to me, he goes, he said, do you guys handle your parades? And I said, well, the city doesn't, the Main Street goes, well, we had to do our parade, but they canceled their parade, or rescheduled it, because Princeton was playing in the state title. He said, <laughs> that was worse than scheduling the whole parade to, to reschedule it. To reschedule it. Yeah. Moving things so there's a lot, a, a lot of work and time goes into it. As we were heading into the break, uh, John, you were about to respond to a point Kevin had just Yeah, made. Kevin was talking about water. So, you know, we, we have uh, um, been working on infrastructure. Uh, we're, we're in pretty good shape on our sewer capacity. So we've put a lot of new sewer plants in in the last 10 years. So our sewer capacities are, are doing pretty well. Plus, we pulled all of our stormwater from our sewers or, or in the process of doing that, which really has helped our sewer capacity. Uh, water is where we've been struggling. Uh, there's about $130 million worth of projects that's going to be happening in Berkeley County in the next couple years. Uh, I was able to work with the IJDC. I'm, I'm on the IJDC. That stands for what? Uh, Infrastructure, Jobs, and Development Council, and also work with the WDA, which is the Water Development Authority. So I was able to work with them. I was able to get a $25 million grant. Uh, Senate President Craig Blair was able to work with them and was able to get another $25 million grant. Uh, a lot of that was because of local buy-in. I was able to work with past commission president, uh, Doug Copenhaver, uh, to be able to get the local buy-in, and that's really what the WDA is looking for, is local buy-in uh, of county commissions to use their ARPA funds at that time uh, to make these projects happen. So with the money that's coming from the state, the $50 million from the state, uh, there's some federal grants coming in. There's about $130 million water, worth of water infrastructure that's going to be happening in Berkeley County. The river plant, which is down off of uh, Route 11 in the Falling Waters area, is going to go from, I believe it's 6 million gallons a day to 10 million gallons a day. Uh, we are purchasing water from the city. The county is purchasing water from the city, from the uh, Big Springs plant, I believe. Mm -hmm. We uh, purchase finished water from them for there that goes to Procter & Gamble. Uh, and we are working to put in a new treatment facility and really the uh, discharge lines in the south of the county, in South Berkeley. Um, they're in dire need of water up there. We have the water to send them. We just don't have the infrastructure to get it there. So a lot of that money is going to be put in for new transmission lines through South Berkeley. So, uh, so yeah, so I, th I think that uh, the, water, the, the water PSD in Berkeley County is working to make sure that uh, we have enough water. 
the worst thing in the world I ever want to hear is the economic development people tell me that we had to turn away some uh, business because we didn't have the water to supply them. That's not something that I find that I that I'm going to deal with in a very good way. So if I am working and economic development comes to me and says, hey, we have this employer, they have X amount of dollars to pay X amount of money, but they need this amount of water and the water PSD saying we can't supply it, we need to figure that out. Has that happened? I, on the residential side, we're fine. On the commercial side, I think we need capacity. Yes, we, we do. I serve on that, that, that committee and uh, that's, been, that's been the talk, that's been the issue and, and I think I, I applaud you for getting the money that they need to build the infrastructure because, uh, yeah, we, we enjoy having Berkeley County as a, as a, 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 a customer, and, and you know, we would still consider more if that was the case, but there's no infrastructure for us to get it there. So yeah. one thing, you know, the city, the city sits pretty well with their water, although recently we've seen it going down to levels that we haven't seen before because of the lack of the rain. But, uh, uh, you know, all the, all the talk. I, I, I remember when American Water walked into my office and I turned around and I said, you're not coming anywhere near the city of Martinsburg. <laughs> we have no desire for you to, to take it, take over anything that we have. And, and Well, I think myself much. and Delegate Hornby were involved in one of those meetings, and uh, I, it wasn't a very favorable meeting for American Water <laughs> from, from Delegate John Hardy either. So. <laughs> well, then we're on the same page. Yeah. By the way, I want to I say before we go any further, um, thank you for everything that you've done down on the state level as a, as a legislator. And I personally, whether you know it or not, uh, I admire what everything that you have done down there. Uh, and, and I'm looking, really looking forward to working closely with you when you become uh, a county commissioner. So. Well, I, I, I certainly hope that I'm successful in that bid to become a county commissioner. And I think that the relationship between the city and the county has 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 really healed over the last uh, couple years and things have gotten better and uh, hopefully continue to keep that uh, those relationships growing and moving in a positive direction so john how will you change the way you think you've been down the legislature we've talked local control things like that if you when you're uh, successful in your bid for county council are you going to change the way you look at the legislature or you think about local well, control? Well, first and foremost, the dynamic will immediately <laughs> yeah, switch. Yeah. You will no longer be looking up at him. He yeah. will now be coming to you. <laughs> sure. So I'm sure that I will be in Charleston whining and crying like every other <laughs> county commissioner and municipality does now, um, you know, working on trying to get the state to uh, help the counties in any way they can. Uh, you know, my entire life, my, my entire adult life, uh, I have managed people, projects, and money. That's what I do. Um, my wife says I'm really good at delegation and I'm really good at finding other people to do things that I don't want to do. But I, I've managed, I've, I've always managed people, uh, projects and money. And I think as a county commissioner, that's really what you're doing. You're managing the county's money. You're managing projects that you've undertaken. And also you're managing the employees of the county. I think it fits well with my background. I think it fits well with my personality. Uh, I think that I bring a lot to the table from the state's point of view, from everything from finances to health departments to really any aspect that you can think of. Right now I'm working on a DMV problem for a constituent. But you make those contacts in Charleston, you, Charleston, you, you build relationships. Uh, you know that you can you go in and have who you can have very candid conversations with and and that's what i want to bring to the county i, I love berkeley county I've, I've been in business here for 30 years i've raised my children here through the public school system and i really want to be able to uh, get back into the local community. I want to get back into my rotary. I want to get back into some, you know, I talked to someone the other day about we're going to maybe try to do a blitz build again. So I was big in habitat before I went to the legislature and we used to do these blitz builds where we'd build a habitat house in five days. And uh, so those are some local community things that I'm really interested in being involved. So you were in the, uh, you were in the county um, council uh, commission meeting with the legislature where we did our legislative round table. And um, I don't think it's any, it, it's public knowledge that the, the commission wants the legislature to give them the ability to raise a 1% sales tax so that we can keep up with the growth here. Um, through some sort of home rule. Through some sort of home rule, kind of like what the, what the municipalities have. What is your thoughts now on that? And I personally think it's a very uphill battle down in Charleston to get something like that passed. But in a year's time, you're going to be sitting 
and asking for that. What's your thoughts on that? So, so as of right now, I am not supportive of a 1% sales tax in the county. Uh, I have not had the opportunity or the ability to sit down with the county's uh, budget to see exactly uh, how the budget. No, I know the budget process is pretty close to how the state budget yeah, process is. I think so. But I've never seen that in minutia. I've never seen where the county has money, where the money's being spent. Not saying I'm, I'm, I, I feel like the county commission that we have has, has done a good job. Being a county commissioner is is not an easy job. You have a, a finite amount of money that you can raise. There's only there's the the state puts lots of caveats on the amount of money that you can raise and how you can raise that money. You must run a balanced budget. You must pay for all your emergency services. You must you have to meet your payroll. So there's there's only a small portion of money that that is able to be divvied around. So I know that they're constantly looking for revenue sources. So as of now, I've I've spoken very public. I've spoken very candid to all the county commissioners that I don't support the one percent sales tax. I think that the one percent sales tax is a non-starter in the legislature. Uh, I think uh, one from raising taxes, even though it's just a one percent sales tax, that I believe that the the sales tax and the home rule or, or being able to collect that sales tax is the backstop for the tax cuts for our personal income tax. So I've always said that getting to 40 or 50% as, as we're hitting those markers, as we're hitting where we need to be in our economy, getting to 40 or 50% in our tax cuts, I think is very easy. I think when you start to get to 60, 70, 80% is where you start to see the struggles if you do not see the economic growth that we need to see. And I think the legislature is using that as their backstop to say we may need to increase consumer-based taxes to continue to drop personal taxes. John, I think that it is hypocritical of Republicans to say we want a decentralized West Virginia state government, more local control, and then say, no, you can't have local control of taxes because we don't want you to raise taxes. We know better than you as to what you should do with your local government. I think that's completely hypocritical. I think if you, you right. give them the home rule, but you make it under the condition that if you want to pass a sales tax, you put a referendum on the ballot and let the people vote. Do we want a state sales tax increase of 1% for our community or not? That way they can decide, and then you guys have cover. We didn't raise taxes, the people did. Yeah, but now you're talking about a completely different piece of legislation. You're talking about a piece of legislation that would make home rule. It would have to be um, the county commission would have to uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Mike? Would have to be on referendum and have to be put to the vote. Right, right exactly. You know I mean? But it also, the county commission And they have to it would reduce be, fees too. Right, and if every county didn't want to do it, they didn't have to do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Permissive. Permissive, I'm sorry. Yeah. The word I'm looking for is permissive. Yeah. So it would be permissive. Mm -hmm. County commissions could do it if they wanted to do it. And if they did want to do it, it would go out for a public referendum. Yes. Well, I could support a piece of legislation like that. I like but, to hear that. And I think, Rob, what, what you're missing is, uh, while we have a very active county commission, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of these counties have three people, not five, yeah. elected to six-year terms. And they that's a lot them. of power in, in a county for three people to decide. But we can't it, hold it, Berkeley it, County hostage because they have three commissioners in some other county 300 other, miles away. Other people are voting. There's, there's 100 of us. So you got to get 51, 51 votes. votes. Oh, I see your point. So, so they, they don't have that trust in their county commission that we may have. Well, but, but again, that's arrogance of saying, I know better than what you know in your local community. If, if those three commissioners vote for a sales tax increase and the people don't like it, they'll vote them out. And they'll, they'll vote them out for people who wrote on a campaign of, I'm going to repeal that, that sales Six, tax. A six-year term, people forget a lot of things in six years. Well, then okay. I mean, but <laughs> I, I that's think, up to the I people. Yeah, I get it. But again, that's saying I know better than the people. I, I think a referendum is the only way to Well, and, and there is a huge fundamental difference between a House member who runs every two years, mm -hmm. a senator who runs every four years, and a county commissioner who runs every six years. There's mm -hmm. a huge disconnect there in the uh, how close you are to the voters. And as a House member, you are as, as close to the voters as you will ever be. Absolutely. You are running a campaign every 17 months. You're running a campaign. And that's always in the back of your mind. And you, that's always in the back of the people's mind. Sure. I mean, I went to Charleston as a staunch cons I went to Charleston as one of the staunchest conservatives that I ever thought was on the face of the planet. And and in five years, the that, that's passed me by. I mean, I still consider myself a, a very fiscal conservative. Um, maybe on the social issues and the and the uh, some, some of the um, 
those issues, it's, it's passed me by. So the, const- the, the, the legislature is constantly changing. The flavor of it is constantly changing. You're talking between 28 and 32 new legislators every, 30, every two years, and these legislators are very green. They are, I mean, it's the first time they've ever usually been involved in a legislative process. And I even said publicly in our county commission race the other, or meeting the other day that the second year of a, of a delegate's term, they tend to soften a little bit. You know, and then because when they get there, you know, it's hellfire and brimstone the first year they get there. So they tend to soften a little bit the second year because they start to understand the process a little better. Then you move into the Senate. The Senate, those guys have typically been around for some time and they start to understand the process. Like the process or not, it's a process. So it's easy for a county commissioner to say, why aren't you guys giving us this? Why aren't you giving us that? Well, they're, they're, they can be five years removed. Why is, why is the county commission a six-year term? Who that's, determined that? That's just how it is in the Constitution. That, that's how it was set So that's set part of the up. Constitution. That it's set in the Constitution would be, that, that would be yeah. looked at and could possibly It would have to be voted on. Because those people. people need longer terms because you have to have cover for when you make controversial decisions early in your term. <laughs> yeah. well, As Mike said, it gives you five years to forget about it. Well, and sometimes... And sometimes <laughs> he makes a good point. It, it, it's a very he good point. It's a very good point. point. Yes, absolutely. But Somebody that's needs to bring that up <laughs> to the front. When, when and and here's the thing. Um, I found out recently that you know m- municipalities are a creature of the legislature, while county commi- counties are creatures of the Constitution. So there are end arounds for Berkeley County to get sales that you could incorporate Spring Mills, you could incorporate Inwood, you could incorporate um, more municipalities. Mun- mun- municipalities are essentially owned or made up uh, by the legislature. And, well, and if- I want to get back to Rob's point here for a second. On, do you think that if you could corral, get a true representative sample of the citizenry of West Virginia, that they would prefer that their lives be as controlled as they are through Charleston, or would they prefer that it be controlled through their local governments? Through, through they the don't want to be controlled at all. There you go. So. <laughs> I don't understand the 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 legislate legislators uh, resistance to home rule in their counties. I mean, if they if they got bad commissioners, okay, you know, there's an elective electoral process to take care of that. But to default to no, Charleston knows what's better for pick well, a county, but he, Lincoln here's County, the thing, Mingo County, here's whatever. The thing, John, it's just not right. The roads were governed by the counties back in the day. And most of them failed, so the state had to take over. So the state has had to take over these ent- entities and become centralized because the counties have failed. A lot of these counties are small, and they can't afford to do the things that they do. So they have to have the control from Charleston. The same with the jails. The jails were controlled by the county. Yeah. The jails were very they, – they were not very well taken care of. The state came in and put these regional jails in to take control of it because – most counties do not have the problems that Berkeley County has. We, we We're are a very gener- different animal to, to the rest of the state. But I don't. how does that translate to you can't give your teachers a raise or you can't um, have a, a 1% sales tax or whatever with, with, within your jurisdiction? It, it, it translates to 51 votes. Yeah. But where's the resistance? The, Southern part of state. <laughs> everywhere they everywhere not be, in the Eastern Panhandle. Right. Because they prefer to be controlled by Charleston. And I, and they, I, don't, they don't see it as being controlled by Charleston. They see it as being, hey, we want to be paid the same as every other and I also said, the same job. I also said this the other day in the Chamber of Commerce meeting. There are legislators who take pride in kicking the Eastern Panhandle in the teeth yep. every opportunity they get. That's they do not want the Eastern Panhandle to have something that do, they do not have. And there is a group of of delegates that are in different parts of the state that if they can do anything to affect the crying whining eastern panhandle delegation they just have complete joy in it even if it does not improve their own situation correct correct and uh, before we uh, end our segment a couple of things to uh clean up here just from some text that i've gotten during the half hour one was from the admiral who said regarding John Gilstrap's question: If any prospective businesses have been denied water uh, because or denied denied uh, or ch- decided not to come because of yeah. a water availability in the early 2000s, Frito Lay was asking for more water than was available at the time, so they had to turn them away. That was from Bill, and Bill is you remember, of course, president of the county commission at one point. Uh, in regards to the uh, decorated house at the end of Daniel, uh, Kathy Cloud texted me and said that was done by Kim Gall, 
Uh, Jay Gall is her husband. And I remember Jay from Martinsburg Little League when he was a player, back when he was 12 years old, however long ago that was. Uh, and uh, she's a special ed bus driver, too, Kim is. So, so thank you, Kim, by the way, because the county needs more bus drivers. We all know that because of how many times that uh, bus routes get canceled. Kids have to find their own way to school because we don't have enough bus drivers. So just to clean up a few of those things. Yeah, and hopefully we are not going to be hearing from our local economic development people that we cannot – you know, have a, a, a well-established business to move here or a business that's here that wants to grow. Sometimes we forget about growing our local businesses that we already have uh, um, because we don't have capacity for them. So the, one of the big pushes for the river plant to go from $6 million to $10 million was mm-hmm. for CEC Steel. They're going to need about a million gallons a day, but they need raw water. They don't need finished water. They need water for cooling purposes. So they're going to use about a million gallons of, of raw water uh, for cooling purposes, and they are going to recycle as much water as they can uh, in their processes. Okay, so they'll keep using their own supply of water. They are a very, they are as about as green as a steel company as you can get. At some point, do they treat water and send it back into the river? I don't think so. I think they're just constantly using no, their water think, for cooling, and they're going to lose. And they're going to lose. Yeah, they're they're going to lose. No water could be discharged back into the river unless it yeah. went through the sewer plants. But um, I would ask them that. But when I asked them on the program and they asked me for my list of questions, it didn't yeah. work out so well. Yeah. They declined to come on. Right. <laughs> Well, they're in a very early phase of, of, just, <laughs> You're getting, laughing, of just getting started, so they're probably still working through some of those issues. Um, I've had some meetings with them. I mean, I'm very excited about them. They're going to provide, um, you know, they're using an old brownfield site, the old DuPont site down there that's probably as, as polluted as any piece of property in Berkeley County. Um, and they're, they're as green as green can be to produce steel. Uh, they're providing very uh, well-paid jobs, very. and quite a few of them. So, uh, you know, I, I've, I've found them to be very easy to work with. Good. Maybe you could have them on the show sometime. Maybe, maybe we could. <laughs> maybe we could. You know, I'll, I'll say this. Everybody calls me up and says, why are you letting Rob have this person on? Why are you asking those questions? I, I don't get to censor this man or tell him what to do. He may be an employee of mine, but the show is the creature of the show. And, and people need to realize we cover everything from all sides, and we try to give everybody the perspective. So, I, you know, I don't sit there and yell at Stubblefield for asking questions or, or Gilstrap, call him up and say, why did you ask that or why did you do this? We don't provide questions to people in advance, ever. You either come on the show or you don't, right? Yeah, I actually sent I actually sent Mike a text the other day, and there was someone on, and I can't remember who it was, and it was a pretty liberal Democrat, and they were, you know, it may have been from the the Policy Institute. Sure, that's it. That's who it was. <laughs> that's exactly. Who it was. And um, you know, and the best thing they've ever done is they came up with a really creative name. Um, <laughs> but I, I texted Mike and I said, you know, that's great radio, and I really appreciate Rob, and I appreciate the freedoms that he's given to bring people on the show that have completely different points of view than a. Uh, than, than than I do and others do, so I, I appreciate that. Absolutely. It's good. Thank you. It's good to hear what other people were thinking, and like I, I've told people many times, you know, I have two daughters, twenty five and twenty one. Their politics are very different than their fathers, <laughs> and that's okay because they're smart, independent women who are thinking the way they want to think as young people. And I can only hope and pray as they start to make their own living and pay their own they'll way start, that they'll, they'll start thinking right they'll, for sure. <laughs> they'll become rational. Hey, and, you know, that institute. Get, get him off your cell phone, Bill. I, That's the first I res- call. I respect Seth and, and, and his institute. And, and they come in my office downtown, you know, down in Charleston, and they'll pitch their ideas. And I just look at them and say, you, same as last time, I disagree with 100% of what you're yeah. saying. Yeah. It's just, it is what it is. And he, he does it. Yeah, last session, Seth lost his house. He's, he yeah. was, yeah, he, 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 his apartment he, he lost his apartment building Oof. and lost all of his, uh, his stuff. So, yeah. Uh, hey, and uh, Delegate Paul Espinosa, during one of our segments, sent some information, too, and it had to do with uh, teacher pay in the state. Well, how much we spend, it really had to do with teacher pay as well as how much we spend on students. Per, per capita. Per, yeah. capita. Per, pu- per, per pupil. pupil. So our, our student spending is about 14000 something per student in, in, in West Virginia which is actually higher than the national average and higher than most states around us. So yeah, here it is. Uh, West Virginia spends $14,274 per student. That is 14th. The U.S. average is 11,462. Uh, surrounding states of Maryland, 14,774, and Virginia, 11,141. Virginia is 24th. Maryland is 13th. And again, West Virginia 
14th, and then teacher pay adjusted for inflation. And I think Paul said these are from two years ago. Yeah, I think so. Uh, West Virginia, 41st in teacher pay, 51,243. And for a small state that doesn't generate billions and billions of dollars in tax from, revenue. From, in tax revenue 41st, we're climbing. We're getting there. We used to be 50th. Uh, well, and how and, and, well, here's the problem, though, Mike. Maryland is 12th at 62,370. Uh, this says Virginia is 46th at 49,804. That's statewide. Uh, that really doesn't help us here because Loudoun County pays way in excess so what, of that, and that's where a lot of teachers Maryland, from here go. But the real question is of Ocean, that, of Ocean that, City, Maryland has probably a bigger budget than the whole of West Virginia. But I mean, here's the, the real question of that is that that money that per pupil spending how much of that makes it to the student? Well, that's how much problem. makes that down to the classroom? We've we've had those audits and understood that we're top mm -hmm. heavy. So much money goes to administrative mm -hmm. part of the school system that it's not matriculating down to the students and in the classroom. Yes, it's a fact. And that is a fact. But you but you guys have gone into power saying we're going to do something about that and nothing has been done about well, it. Well, we didn't get no, amendment too. I don't, uh, and I think yeah, the governor torpedoed you on that. I think it's really unfair to say nothing has been done about that. I think we've yeah. made lots of strides, especially. I mean, I've only been down there a year. I feel like last year we made some major improvements in education. Well, uh, what we're, and, not, we're talking about admin funding. And, but admin funding, I think, is also there are we put in guidelines to to um, penalize those counties that are going above a certain sort of percentage in, in admin, admin costs. When does and, that kick in? It, it, I think it's about 18% is where it kicks in. And what year does it kick in? I think it's already in place. In place there, there, are, there are laws in place, and we will be taking it further and addressing those. Starting, yeah. starting salary in Loudoun County for a teacher with a bachelor's degree is $57,000. If you got a doctorate at $69,000. Yeah. What's, what's the average income in Loudoun County, John? I have no idea. It, it's probably double what it is in West Virginia. I would imagine. Yeah. 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 Loudoun County is one of the richest. But rich, if you're a teacher, it what, doesn't matter what the, what the local. The well, there's, there's, the there's nothing. There's, we'll never get to that right. level. Yeah. So it, the average cost of living in West Virginia, I would rather live here and make $60,000 than move to that rat, rat race that that's, mm -hmm. is the city and, and make $70,000. You, you wish you could make $60,000 living here. I wish. That's right. Yeah, and, and to just touch on the things that the legislature you, has man. done in education. Martinsburg? We, we have added we, High school? we've added a lot more nurses, we've added a lot more counselors, we've mm -hmm. added aides, we've done a lot of things to try to improve the education. And and as I said uh, in a meeting the other day, we've done a lot of that stuff. Now I think we're going to have to just take a few years here to sit back and kind of see how some of this stuff works out. We've put these programs in place and we're going to have to see how this works out. Now that doesn't really talk about the teacher's pay, but it talks about mm -hmm. the things that we have done to try to take and uh, take some of the pressure off the teachers with the aides, the nurses, right. the counselors. And at some point in time, at some point in time, we're going to have to say that students' performance in the schools, there has to be some buy-in from the parents. Yes. There's going to have to be a coming, a reckoning, to say that students' behavior and students, the way that they are, perform, are, are, are working in school, not achieving or performing, but the way that they handle themselves in school, their behavior. their behavior has got to be a reflection of parents are going to have to be more involved. I 100%. And, and there's no way around that. No. There, there really isn't. Hey, uh, just about out of time here. Well, actually, we are over time. Uh, John, final word from you, sir. Well, thank you all very much for the opportunity. I hope everyone has a Merry Christmas. Uh, spend a lot of time with your family and eat too much. <laughs> Good advice. I've started. I've started. <laughs> Good to see you again. Thank you. Kev, it's up to you. You want to hang out some more? Stacy's coming in next. Stacy Rome. Oh, definitely. Oh.